actually in the process of finishing and cleaning out the house that she lived in for 63 years with my dad. My father passed away in December, so it's a little bit new. Um, but she's all right, and she had already kind of picked out where she wanted to live once she was on her own, so that was ready to go. Um, and she's settling in, transitioning, transitioning, but I'm there a lot, so I got a support home. It's good you can be. And growing up, just getting to know her and see her is just a loving, wonderful person. It's, it's remarkable to hear the story in the background that, that where she was coming from. So tell us what happened to your mother and the family um, back in Amsterdam in 1940. Yeah, how did they come to be in Amsterdam in the first place? Because I know they were originally Dutch. They were not Dutch. They were German. So, so this is my grandparents' wedding. So we got my my grandmother and grandfather in the center there, Heinz and Margaret Lichtenstern. Um, Margaret's parents are all the way all the way over to the right, Louis and Flo Speer. And then Heinz's parents are next to Margaret. Um, Margaret's sister is sitting on uh, right behind. Did I do it this way? Do you see the pointer? No. No. You don't see exactly. your grandparents are the so. Room. Anyway, so anyway, my my mother, my grandmother's sister's there. My grandmother's brother's there. My grandfather's brother's there. Big happy family at my grandparents' wedding. 1932, right before Hitler <coughs> came in. They lived in western Germany. This big rock is right outside of Dusseldorf. Then Hitler comes along and the family says, you know, we're not so sure about this. So my mom was born in 1935 and my grandfather's, um, by 1936, he's like, we're leaving. We're, we're, we gotta go somewhere. His boss,
you know, hair on my neck stand up when I saw, wait a minute, my father, my grandfather's name is like part of the Eichmann trial. Mm -hmm. Where was he tried? What was it in Nuremberg? He tried in Israel? Or? He was tried in Israel. If you don't know that story, that's a, yeah. Yeah, well, that, I, I, I know it comes from the scene you know, where he's got a bad, uh, the, the people say, he yeah, was at a glass booth, yeah, so yeah, they wouldn't shoot, shoot, shoot him. Shoot him and, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they found him in Argentina and brought him to Israel. Yeah. Right. So, so um, why is that written in Hebrew? Just that little box, because the the Israelis found this document. That's some sort of stamp from the trial of you know evidence oh, such evidence, and such. And like, evidence like, you know, this is you know it's yeah, entered into evidence on such and such a date. Um, it, God. So there's history, right? There. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Where so, are we next? <laughs> so that then the question was, you so your grandfather was able to go to Amsterdam. Is that how the story of the doll comes up? Uh, because I, if you read this book, to these promise of the doll is very key. Right. So even after they're rearrested and back in the camp in Westerbork, my grandfather's still being sent on work trips to the city. So the family is now prisoners, and my grandfather's going back and forth, you know, two days a week or two days every other week or something to make whatever arrangements for more metal that we brought to the camp. And during one of those trips, he bought a doll for my mom. This is the doll. I, I named her Papia because my mom actually can't remember the actual name. Um, she was brand new. And on my mom's ninth birthday, and this is a picture of my mom when she was nine years old, um, they had a birthday party for her. In the camp. In the camp. So how many kids were in concentration camps were given brand new dolls <coughs> on their birthdays? Um, and, and it's just rare, incredibly rare. And my grandmother made a cake, again, I'm doing my air quotes, cake out of rotten potatoes. My mom remembers it distinctly. It very much looked like a cake. It didn't taste like a cake, but it looked like a cake. And the doll was presented to her, and she was absolutely thrilled. Um, but it came with a request. My grandfather pulled her aside and showed her that the head was hollow, and he stashed money in it. And he said, OK, this is the only money we have with us. Life is bad right now, and it's going to get worse. I know it is. This is going to save our lives one day, and you're in charge of it. Don't let anybody ever take the doll. So that was a huge responsibility for a nine-year-old. <coughs> and she knew it. She absolutely knew the gravity of that. Um, and didn't you tell us once the, about that responsibility, how that can be yeah, I, I, you know, randomly uh, had a friend who was a um, flight attendant, and she was telling me that there's statistics that anybody in a um, flight emergency situation, a, a flight, you know, a plane goes down or something, people who have responsibilities toward other people usually fare better in that kind of a situation than people with no responsibilities to anybody. Because you're, you pull yourself together because you're helping your kid, your spouse, your sibling, your friend, whoever's with you. Mm. Whereas if it's just you, maybe you don't try so hard. Mm. You try more for the other person, which is a wonderful thing about human beings, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I don't know if that responsibility is something that really helped my mom when things were hard. Yeah. 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 And then in September, they were put on one of the cattle cars, and they were taken to the next camp. And this little yellow arrow on that piece of paper, it says on that paper that the, these metal Jews, as our concession, because we're arresting them, even though you want new other Nazi Albert Speer want to keep them free, we'll only send them to the privileged camps. We're going to send them to a place called Trasenstein. It says it right there. Um, we won't send them to the places we won't name, mm. those bad places. And so they were sent to Trader Shop. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, how was it in 
any way a privilege to be on the camps. So it was, there's actually a video, if you, if you Google it on YouTube, there's some, um, for me, I think there's 11 minutes of this video available. Um, a propaganda film was, was put together at the camp. It's called Hitler Gives the Jews a City. And it was supposed to be this wonderful place. There were there were actually people who um, bought bought like their timeshare condominiums there. Um, they invested that they could live there. It was presented as a place where the Jews could go and be safe. Um, it's the place where the Red Cross came and looked, and they were shown that everything is fine. We're treating people well. Of course, when they were being shown that. They knew that if they didn't act like everything was good, that they would be shipped off to Auschwitz the next day, which many were anyway. Um, and that film, you can find it. It's, it's out there. But the camp, it was a fortified city built in the 1700s to keep invading armies out. This is in Czechoslovakia. Um, you know, the Nazis found a city with walls around it. You can keep armies out prisoners in, the whole city became a prison camp, about 12% of the people who were sent to Trazenstadt survived. There was no gas chambers there, although they were building one towards the end of the war. But people were just dying from the bad conditions. Not enough food, no medical help, no medicine, lice, rats, bed bugs. You got sick, you died. Starving. Um, the picture is one of the, um, it's, it's in their museum. This is supposedly what it looked like. Um, triple bunks. Uh, I showed the picture to my mom and she goes, yeah, but that's really clean and not crowded. It was always crowded. There was always people. You'd have a room with 80 to 100 people with these triple bunks. No privacy. Um, and a bathroom that had three or four sinks. And then there was the outhouse that had a line of 10, 10 holes with no privacy. It was terrible, it was really horrible. And so was it men separated from women? Was your family separated? In the um, yeah. Men were in one barracks, women and children in another, so my mom would be at the top, Robbie in the middle, and my grandmother at the bottom. So what happened with the, you had your grandparents and their parents were separated at one point too? They were right, so I didn't even talk about the grandparents from since the beginning. So all of my mother's grandparents were in Amsterdam with them. They were caught up in one of these razzias months before um, my mother's family ended up in the camps. They were sent to Westerbork too. The second time my my mother was in Westerbork, her grandparents were still there, but 10 days later, they were sent to Trezenstein, all four grandparents. Mm -hmm. So then when the, fam the, the core of the family got to Trezenstein, the grandparents were there, but they weren't also different. different. You know, my mom was still in her back and she was, oh yeah, they were on this street, they were on that street. Mm -hmm. um, so you saw them there. Yeah, you could see each other. You could walk around the camp freely, mm -hmm. um, but you couldn't leave the camp. Right. Yeah. And how, what, so what happened that allowed your mother and parents to be? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of slides and come back to this, but I want to want to jump to this part of the story. So this notice on the left comes out. Don't try to read it. It's German. I know it's impossible to read. Uh, but this is saying that the next day there's going to be a transport to the right um, we're taking 2,500 men aged between 16 and 55. There'll be no exceptions. We're going to go build a work camp. We're, where that transport actually went was Auschwitz. Nobody was building a camp. This was a trip to Auschwitz. This was one of 11 transports over the course of 30 days of, with 17,000 people that were shipped to Auschwitz to their deaths. <laughs> This 16 to 55 year old man met my grandfather. He was on the list. And my mom tells the story very vividly. She remembers it. 
it's, you're given the note the night before, the family's up all night, they're despondent, and he is just, he, he lies down on her bunk and cries to say goodbye. Like, you know, what do you do? There's nothing you can do. He's been trying to protect his family, and now they're taking him away. He gets to the train the next day, he reports as he's supposed to, he's depressed, and somebody says, don't you have a Paraguayan passport? <coughs> it doesn't work. You know, it didn't stop me from Westport, it didn't stop me from Traysenstadt, I'm here. It doesn't work. But he shows the passport, and he's given this little piece of paper. I have it. I need to send one line of paper. My grandmother saved it. It says, Ausgeschieden, which means withdrawn. His camp number, his name, and then his birthday. He's withdrawn from the transport <coughs> to Auschwitz because he's got that passport. And he doesn't go. And I'm sure if he had gone, the rest of the family would have gone as well. Because the, this was the men's transport. The ne, you know, the next week it was the women who were going to be sent to be with their husbands who were making, who were at the work camp. And then the next transport was the children to go visit, you know, to go, not visit, to be with their parents. They just kept, it was always a story. Mm. And so, where did the passport come from? That was my big question. The whole time I was writing about Mama, well, where did you get the passport? I don't know. I don't know. She was only nine. Yeah. Right. So after I published the book, because I, I had been looking everywhere for information about these Paraguayan passports. Everywhere. I, every archive I went to, I always looked for these passports. Couldn't find anything. So after the book came out, my mom hands me an article from a, it's just an article in a Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. Um, publication. She goes, you might want to read this. It's about passports. And it's this whole thing about this passport operation. And there's a picture of one of the passports. And I said, but that's got the same handwriting as your passport, Mom. I've looked at enough of these. I know this handwriting. And so I discovered the lot of screws. This is really kind of complicated. I will try to do it quickly. The, the folks that have the red box under them are Polish diplomats. They're Christian, and they're working in Switzerland. So this is the Alexander Lados, is the Polish ambassador to Switzerland, and Rokiski and Rinievich are his right-hand men. Julius Kuhl, the last one, in, on, on the right. He is a yeshiva dropout. He's Polish, living in Switzerland, and he wants to be a diplomat. He wants to learn political science. And what does he do? He starts, um, he meets Alexander Lados. He starts playing chess with him and losing on purpose. And he gets himself a job in the consulate. So he is a Jew working now for the Polish um, embassy. And then we have Al Abraham Silverstein. He is a Zionist, left wing. Um, he had been in Switzerland because of this recent Zionist conference. And he just was a Polish Jew who happened to be in Switzerland when the war broke out. Of course, he wasn't going to go back to Poland. He's going to stay where he is. And we have Chaim Ice, who is part, he is one of the founders of Agudas Israel, which is ultra orthodox right wing. Judaism, and he was in Switzerland too. These are the men who make the passport. How do they make the passport? Complicated, but I put this flow chart together because it, it makes it work a little better. Okay, red is Polish, blue is, is Jewish, green is the money, um, and purple is sort of this combination. <laughs> Lados and Renevich oversee the whole thing. They provide diplomatic cover-up. They let the embassy be used for the operation of making these passports. When the Swiss police find out about it, because we got we got diplomats making passports for different a different country, we got Polish diplomats making South American passports. This is you know this is you don't do this. Um, it's illegal. The Swiss police find out about it, they're interviewing them, and they're like, you don't want to uncover this. This will be an embarrassment to you. 
you want to leave this story alone. They, they, like, they, they provide all this cover up and, and, and the overall thing to make it work. Julius Kuhl, the Jewish guy working in the, in the embassy, he connects Silver Shine and Ice to the diplomats. He introduces everybody and he's the go between. So, paperwork, basically, the word gets out to Jews in occupied Europe. If you can send us your pictures and your birth dates and your names, we can do this. So these, this, the mail is being sent to Bern, Switzerland. Um, dear Uncle Albert, dear Uncle you know, so-and-so, um, here's, here's some pictures from a recent family gathering so you can remember us. I put the kids' birthdays on the back so you can maybe send them a birthday gift. It's like code. Silver, Shine, and Ice are get, gathering these, these, these pictures and the information. They bring it to Konstanty Rokiski, and they're also getting money from Jewish organizations around the world who are funding this. The money also goes to Rokiski. He then takes the money over to the honorary consuls of different South American countries where he has to pay the bribe. Here is the money. Can we have some blank passports? So they get the blank passports for the money. Rokiski is the handwriting that I recognized, and he fills out the passports. We're talking 5,000 passports that this one man wrote you know, in his little office by himself. They do not give the real passports to the Jews. What they do is they, they, they give the passports to Silver, Shine, and Ice, who copy them, and the copies of the passports get sent to the Jews who need them for, for protection. Because if they send them the real ones, that'd be really illegal. They're trying to make it a little bit less illegal. We're just sending them the copies. They can't travel, they can't emigrate on these. Um, and, and some of the passports have notarizations that go with them. When you said copies, how were, what was the technology for copies? I time? think they basically had Xerox machines, but maybe not Xerox, but they yeah, had well, copies. Copy machines, okay. um, this is the notarization that goes with my grandparents' passport. Um, and I was able to track the stamp on it to this Ignaz Hersfeld, who was a notary in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and there I am with Ignaz's son. Um, who told me the story that Ignaz never would have done something illegal, but maybe here he would have, just to <laughs> save humanity. Yeah. That is such a powerful state. It's just, yeah. None of us want to break the law, but there are moments in our lives. There's a moral judgment. But yeah. Which law do you uphold? Right. Um, and what I love about the story is that you have Poles, Jews, Christians, left wing, right wing, um, and they're all working together for a greater cause. It's not about their politics, it's not about their religion, it's about their morality. And that's like just so important. And there's kind of not enough of that going on in the world right now. So here, here. Here. <laughs> the value of a human life, and that's been yeah. rejected and discarded by too many. Yeah. But there it was left to so what happened after after the war? And okay, so I'm um, gonna okay. go quickly. They're liberated by the Russians in May 1945. They're scared to death of the Russians. Their you know the reputation is worse than that of the Nazis. Um, it takes two months to get back to Amsterdam. Lloyd Miller was an American soldier who made an impression on my mom along the way. They they stopped at a, a, a U.S. military base, not base, but a outpost or whatever. And this Lloyd Miller was really friendly and I'm sorry I've lost track. Terrence and staff is where? What country? Czechoslovakia. Okay, thank you. Okay, so they're in Czechoslovakia, they need to get home. Right. Lloyd Miller was at another place in Czechoslovakia and um, he just made an impression on my mom. Gave her her first chewing gum she ever had and chocolate bars and showed the kids cartoons and um, she, she had this little crush on him. <laughs> um, and he gave her this picture. I have the photo. So you know, great. he gave the photo to her. Oh, and what about Robbie and the Russian troops? All right, we'll back up. Yeah, back up. Back up. The Russian troops come in. The family's actually hiding in a basement because there's still fighting going on. 
when they finally feel like, you know, there's someone who throws a grenade and, you know, there's still violence. When they finally come out of the basement, the Russians are there and my grandmother's like, don't go, don't go near them. They're, they're scary people, they do bad things. But of course, Robbie does go near them. He's eight years old. It's actually his birthday. They were liberated on his birthday. And he goes to the sidewalk and he salutes them coming in. And some Russian guy grabbed Robbie and took him away. <clears throat> my grandmother is freaking out. You know, we survived the Germans and now the Russians, they took my kid. And, and, and this was really you know, very scary. But he came back, I don't know how long it was, he came back with the food. They had given him the oranges and the whatever else. They, that they, they took him out of joy to give him, let me give him Yes, yes. They, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, we got a little kid here, because there weren't a lot of kids who survived. Yeah. And um, they gave him food and he brought him back to the family. Wow. And then Lloyd Miller was helping along the way and made him feel like real people. Like, just tell me, what's the world like? What's been going on? What was it like in the camps? Yeah. Conversation that they had all night, um, and then they had to have all this paperwork to get back to Amsterdam. The Dutch only took back seven thousand Jewish refugees into the country after the war. Now, one hundred and four thousand had been taken out and murdered. They lost one hundred and four that were murdered. They only took seven thousand back. There was room for more. They did, but they didn't want refugees. They didn't want people that the state would have to support. Right. But, um, see this card, this is the Allied Expeditionary Forces D Displaced Persons <laughs> Registration Record. And it's my mom's, this big, the big one. And it says that they are stateless in the yellow circle. And somebody crossed out stateless and wrote Paraguay. I think they got back into Amsterdam quicker because they were not stateless. They were Paraguayan. They had a passport. And of course, they'd be leaving soon, right? <laughs> so that passport saved them again. When they got back to Amsterdam, um, my grandfather went to a friend's house. Um, the man's name was Robert Koch. And he went there and said, we made it. I didn't think we'd make it. But you know, before the war, remember I gave you our furniture and Margaret's fur coat and the silver to hold on to? This is one of his friends he gave things for taking care of. I believe this is Robert Puck's store. I've been trying to trace this man down. Um, and the man said, get out of here. You weren't supposed to come back. He had been a Nazi collaborator. Some of the people that they trusted were not trustworthy. Now, he had sold the fur coat and the silver and what have you, and he wanted nothing to do with that. Um, even though my mom survived, my uncle survived, my grandparents survived, my grandfather's parents survived, there were a lot who didn't. My grandmother's, this, these are all my grandmother's relatives. Her parents, her brother, her cousins, her aunts and uncles did not survive. This is 19 people that are related to my grandmother that I know to know. So, you know, this is, there's a story of survival, but if you have to remember, it's in the midst of this. Um, but the family did settle in. We believe the money that was in the doll was used once they got back to Amsterdam. Um, Effort Young did return all the money that was not used to get that passport. My grandfather ended up with a job in a better position than he had before the war in the same company that he worked for before the war. Um, because so many people, it was a Jewish firm, so many people died, he went to the top as director. Um, and he was able to build a life again. And they, they lived in Amsterdam, and, or they moved to a suburb right outside for a few years. And then the Korean War started. It scared my grandfather. He said, let's get, I'm not staying in Europe. There's gonna be World War III, I'm out of here. He moved the family to Rio de Janeiro. 
So my mom was now in an American school in a Portuguese speaking country, and she knew German and Dutch. Um, so, and she missed three years of school during the war. So she was trying to play catch up. And in 1953, they moved to Riverdale. And there's my, my mom's wedding, mom and dad and Robbie and Mark. I thought that was a good way to come full circle. Wow, what, is, what an extraordinary story. And I remember the day I was talking with your mom. I must have been in high school. We were learning languages. And I talked about learning French. And we were learning Spanish. And I asked her what she knew you know, other languages than German. And she sort of looked at me and she said, yes, I do. <laughs> and that, there was such a, like, a pause there. That there's a story behind that, but I didn't know it was this Yeah, story. well, then when, when she went to college, she majored in French. Mm. <laughs> But she said it was terrible because everything she did, she had to go back to the Dutch. Uh -huh. Or so she would, like if she's translating between French and English, she went via the Dutch. Via Dutch, she had to go English to Dutch and then go back to the French. <laughs> well, we are all people who want to be helpers. We're inspired by the story, and I wanted just a final question to ask: What, what do you recommend to your listeners, and how to share? Um, a, a good, a good takeaway and a ways to help, how we can help today in the face of the challenges that our own politics can present or the world around us. Um, to paraphrase Rabbi Heschel, the Holocaust didn't start with the gas chambers, it started with words. we got to start with our words. Um, who do you talk to? What do you say? Do you challenge other people's words when they're wrong, when they're biased, when they're bullying? Um, because the bystanders, bystanders could have stopped this. You know, there were the victims, there were the perpetrators, and there was a whole lot of bystanders who did nothing. There were helpers, but there were bystanders. Um, this is a pyramid of hate from the Anti-Defamation League, and you know, hopefully you never find yourself above the blue level of this. But if you're in the blue level, work on that. If your neighbors are in the blue level, work on them. You know, fear of differences, non-inclusive language. You know, how can you just include people who are different than yourselves in your community something? Because the more we, you know, the whole thing about separating people, the, the Jews were separated from, I didn't even go into that, but the, you know, you, you have to shop at a Jewish store, you know, the, the kids can't go to the public school, that, that piece. That's so that they don't have friends. Who's gonna protect someone who's not your friend? You know, that kind of thing. So make friends with people that are different. You know, this is, you know, we all, you know, in Vermont it's really hard. For me to find someone who's racially different than myself is, 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 is difficult. There are, there are, these people don't exist in Vermont. Um, okay. <laughs> One person of a different race in Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, you know, we need to get to know people who are different than ourself, ourselves. And when we see fake news, we need to challenge it. Propaganda is really, truly bad. Um, it's evil. Um, find out, you know, find your news from more than one source. Uh, make sure it's reliable, um, and include, just include people, and stop the bullying before it starts. That, that's the most important thing we can do. Well, thank you for sharing your story. You know, Heidi, for being here. If you'd like to come up and talk and ask any other questions, you're welcome to. And I have books if anybody wants to buy a book. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, well, thank you. Thank you again.